Hello and welcome to the First Issue Club podcast. We're your weekly comic book reading club for new first issues. Like always, we've got a couple great books to get into, but we're lucky today because we've got a guest. You know him from The Surrogates, his work on Valiant, DC, and so, so much more. Comic book writer and creator Robert Vendetti is with us today. Hey, Robert. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Thanks for having me on. I'm great. Thanks so much for being here. Um, so we wanted to have you on today because your new book, Tankers, is coming out soon, April 7th, I believe. We're very excited for it. I was looking forward to talking to you about this book already. But when I saw the promo video for the for the first issue making its rounds on Twitter, my my, my anticipation went into a whole different stratosphere. Can can we talk about that a little bit? Oh, one hundred percent. This will be cool. I, you're the first person that I've spoken to press wise about the the video that's brought it up. So yeah, I, man, let's get into it. I can't believe that. How does a comic book writer, professional, a, comic. a professional comic book writer, get their hands on such a legitimate? tank and machine gun yeah so the guy who shot the video is a really good friend of mine his name is brockton mckinney yeah and he does a lot of uh of the video stuff for bad idea and also other clients as well he's also a comic book writer he writes screenplays super talented guy he's one of my best friends and so we get together periodically and we and we work together um you know just to hang out you know working writing can be kind of solitary you know so we'll get together and we'll uh do some work together and stuff like that and i was talking to him about tankers and i mentioned how i kind of was thinking about maybe doing some kind of promo video and i don't know why i had never thought of it before but i was like and there's a place like an hour from from where i live where you can like rent a tank and like operate <laughs> like a like a you know a, a, an industrial like construction equipment and stuff like that and he was like are you serious and i was like yeah and i like pulled out the brochure and i showed it to him and and we just started talking about it like this is the kind of video we would do. And, you know, the, the concept of me sort of being a method writer and in order for me to <laughs> you know, write anything, I don't just study it. I have to really live it, you know, and right. so, like a method actor or whatever. And so, you know, just really basing the video around that concept. And, and we took that to bad idea. Um, Josh Johns is, is one of the guys who does a lot of the uh, media and marketing and stuff like that for bad idea. And uh, we took it to him. And kind of pitched the idea to him and, and he loved it and and uh came in and up the ante and it ended up being what everybody saw so <laughs> for people who don't know uh tankers is about a uh i could i could probably actually quote it i said the line so many times in the video but it's about a crack team of mercenaries in mech suits who work for a company called greenleaf oil and greenleaf oil has invented time travel to send the tankers back in time to divert the comet to kill the dinosaurs. So dinosaurs will keep living and dying for millions more years. And then we'll have more oil in the present. And we'll never run out, right? Right. And so it's obviously an absurdist satirical concept. And uh, the video very much leans into that absurdist satirical idea. So in the video, I, I drive a tank. I operate a industrial scoop to like dig for oil on the ground. <laughs> I shoot a 30 cal machine gun and inflatable dinosaurs. like. We do all sort all kinds of crazy stuff. So, anybody that hasn't seen it, uh, it's definitely floating around on social. You can go find it, uh, but it's pinned on my Twitter homepage right now, which is just at Robert Vendetti. It gets you primed for the uh, intensity and and raw power seen within the pages of Tankers. That's for sure. Yeah, I think it took a lot of people by surprise because I mean I heard from a lot of people, you know, and. Uh, even before I was writing comics, which I've been doing about 15 years, I was working in comics on the publishing end for Top Shelf Productions. And there were people who reached out to me and were like, man, what, what is this video? Because <laughs> I'm normally such a like, I'm a pretty quiet, reserved, humble person, you know? And so yeah. uh, people who are like, you know, some of my best friends were like, I cannot believe that you did that video, you know? But I don't know. It, let's just have some fun. You know what I mean? Like, I Oh, know, definitely. The world is so serious right now and there's so much going on. And, uh, you know, my wife works at a hospital setting and, and, you know, deals with COVID patients and, you know, my kids are going through this time and everything. And I don't know, I just kind of just want to put something out into the world that can maybe entertain for a little while, you know, it definitely put a smile on my face. So can can you talk a little bit about the creative team on Tankers? Because as I'm going through some of the preview pages of the book, um, 
I'm equally horrified and smiling ear to ear. It's like such a fun trip. Yeah. So the artist is uh, Juan Jose Reap, and he is a Spanish artist who I worked with in the past on a couple of issues of Wrath of the Eternal Warrior back when I was working at Valiant. Yeah. And those were issues that were set uh, in more of an ancient setting, and uh, they were very sword and and you know shield and and violent kind of issues and. He was just such a phenomenal artist with the level of detail that he brought and the way he handled everything. And so when it came to tankers, he's just the perfect artist for it for two reasons. One, he's able to really handle the level of detail and the action. And I mean, and this is, you know, mechanized armored mech suits fighting dinosaurs. I mean, it's, it's bullets and teeth and, you know, everything. And so he really able is able to communicate all of that. And this is going to sound weird, but he does it in a way that doesn't, seem mean spirited you know sure it's 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 entertaining and it's fun and it's gory but in a in a fun way not in a mean spirited you know gratuitous horrific kind of way and he's also able to really land the emotions of the characters because at no point in the story do anyone in the story ever stop and say we're going back in time to divert a comet. So there's more oil. Like this is absurd. Like they're all in 100%. <laughs> right. Know? Yeah. And so Juan is really able to communicate the intensity of the emotions to help really shore up the absurdity of this concept. And ideally the reader will just get caught up in it and they won't stop and think about the absurdity of it either. You know? <laughs> and so he's just fantastic. And then on um, colors, we have Andrew Dollhouse, who's a colorist I've worked with in the past, very talented guy. Uh, you know, the detail that Juan puts in, that's not an easy project to color. And so uh, Andrew has taken that on and has done some phenomenal work there. I'm, I'm just going through final colors today, actually, to send the book to print. And, um, you know, it's just so vibrant and so much of the detail and everything that he, and the storytelling that Andrew's able to bring to it. And then the letterer is uh, Dave Sharp, who's somebody I've worked with many, many times in the past, including uh, my long run on Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern Corps. He's amazing as well, and uh, it's a great team. Uh, three three thirty two page issues, uh, so they're all oversized. Yeah, and, that's big. Uh, we're, we're putting everything into it, and uh, can't wait for people to see it. So, why bad idea? We don't know too much about this uh, publisher as as comic book fans. They're we know they're new, and we know they've got a lot of talent and a lot of books we're excited about coming. Um, what what made Tankers right for bad idea? That idea is uh, started up by a group of people, um, Warren Simons, uh, Dinesh Shandasani, Hunter Gorenson, Josh Johns, Adam Freeman, all of them I worked with the whole time that I was at Valiant. They all were uh, part of the Valiant crew um, in one capacity or another for the entire time I was there. And then there's also Carl Bowlers who came and joined Valiant just after I stopped working for them. So I never had a chance to work for them, but he's part of Bad Idea too. And we're all just really good friends, you know, launching a company like we did with Valiant is not an easy task, you sure. know, and you're really kind of down in the trenches with everybody and um, talent and, and staff weren't like sort of separated and siloed off from each other. We were kind of all in it together, you know? Yeah. And so we all got to be really close and have good relationships. And so when they got together and we're starting a bad idea and asked me if I wanted to be a part of it, you know, it's just like blues brothers, you know, getting the band back together. It's, sure. you know, it's, it's something that, uh, that I would always love to do. And it's a different type of creativity, right? Like I've, I've done a lot of things in shared universes, like at Valiant and, and, you know, even more work at DC and, I'm very proud of all those things and I'm continuing to do work at DC and I have more projects from them that will be coming out, but that's one kind of creativity, right? You're operating mm -hmm. within one of the rules and the continuities and the histories that are established and your, your one book in, in a publishing line that all has to kind of operate together, you know, bad idea is a different type of creativity. It's much more of a open new concepts, you know, three issues, four issue stories, you know, everything like that nothing sort of linked together in terms of continuity. And so it's very freeing. You get to write your own rules and do your own things, which is a different kind of creativity, you know? And I enjoyed both types of creativity very much. This is just an opportunity for me to sort of get back to um, the type of creativity that I was doing with surrogates and, and other things like that. But like I say, I'll, I'll continue doing it. And that, you know, the idea is that maybe I'll, I'll have a balance with these things going forward. If people aren't excited 
for tankers by now. I don't know what else to tell them. Have, having gotten a little sneak peek, I'll say the end of the book leaves you asking so many questions about where the book's going to go, the possibilities of the the world it's in. So many comic books that I love are the ones that leave you asking tons of questions between the monthly releases. And this, this is certainly one of those books. I appreciate it. Yeah, we, uh, we're having a lot of fun with it. We've definitely got some surprises in there, but it's also a story, you know, behind all the bullets and teeth. There's a lot of heart in it too. And, and uh, we're just really excited to be putting it out. Any other projects you have going on we should know about? I've got some other things that haven't been announced yet, but one that has been announced uh, just recently is that I'll be doing Superman 78 for DC. Yeah. Yeah, which I'm super excited about. It's a uh, uh, comic book series that's going to be set in the world of the uh, Richard Donner, Mario Puzo, Christopher Reeve uh, Superman films. And for anybody who doesn't know my background, I didn't read comic books growing up. I, I didn't get into them until like my mid-20s. But when I was a kid, Superman 1 and Superman 2, that was my entry to comic books. Christopher Reeve is my Superman in the way that John Byrne Superman is other people's Superman or maybe Dan Jurgen Superman or, or what yeah. have you, you know. Christopher Reeve is my Superman. And this is a dream project in the sense that it's a project I never thought would even exist. You know what I'm saying? So I never even <laughs> said to myself, I would love to do that one day because it's just, how could that possibly happen? You know? Right. So when DC reached out to me about doing that, I, I was over the moon. And the artist on that is uh, Wilfredo Torres and Jordi Valera is doing the colors. And, um, you know, the whole first two issues are already done at this point. It'll be launching in July. And uh, I'm also, you know, extremely excited for that. And like I say, it's just that balance of both creativities, you know, to, to work within the continuity and the history established by those Donner films and to be able to open it up and expand that mythology, but, but stick with those rules, uh, is something that's very, very exciting uh, and very energizing creatively. So can't wait for people to see that either. All right. Awesome. We're looking forward to it. Uh, thanks so much, Robert. It's been a pleasure talking to you. One more time, Tankers is out on sale from Bad Idea on April 7th. For our club members, ask your store to pull a copy for you. And don't go anywhere. We'll be right back to talk first issues right after this. Thanks again to Robert. Great guy. Love talking to him. I don't remember if I did my whole intro spiel. What do we talk about on this show? First issue. First issue comic books. Our thing is, you can be new to comic books, or you could be a dusty old fart, smog lording over your stash of long boxes and short boxes and magazine boxes. If you know what those are, you're a comic smog. <laughs> you're an old head. And we, we welcome you too. Um, we got a handful of issues that we're going to talk about today. Ultra Mega, Aero Psych, uh, Orphan and the Five Beasts, maybe even more. We had a bounty of first issues this week, and we're excited to talk about them. Who's in the club today? Who have I got with me? We got me, Budget King. I'm a dusty old fart. Yeah. Greg's here. I'm a regular old fart. <laughs> and I'm Mike D. A cutesy newborn fart. <laughs> I love calling things dusty. You sit a lot. <laughs> That's how you accumulate dust. Definitely. Your own skin cells are rotting right on your body. <laughs> You're turning into dust as you slowly sit and die. Yeah, it is the aging process. Opposite of aging are new and exciting characters and stories. Oh, yeah. All right, let's get into our first book. It's called Ultra Mega. It's out on Image. It's written by James Heron. Anyone familiar with him? Know anything he's done? Um, I I think that this is one of his first books. Well, he, he actually wrote it and drew it. And so lofty goal, because this, this was a thicken. Yeah, it was like 60 pages, right? It came like book bound. Yep. It was huge. Yeah, it felt like a trade. I like that in the back he was like, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I don't even know that I'm into like kaiju stuff or whatever. <laughs> but like, this is what I wanted to write. I hope you enjoyed it. And I was just like, that's a way to write notes. It's just to be like, I'm not trying to sell you on some big concept. I just really like this idea. I think that's one of the things where a lot of times when someone writes a kaiju book that you anticipate that it's gearing towards a crowd that already likes that stuff and it's just going to serve up a lot more of the same. Mm -hmm. This immediately 
diverged into what I think is another area. Should, do we need to say what a kaiju is? Kaiju is like a big Godzilla monster. Yeah, and it's specifically normally associated with trying to destroy a city. Yeah, they're always set in metropolitan areas and buildings get knocked over like crazy. Mm -hmm. A lot of like the classic anime and manga that deal with this, it's like the same city that's protected by like one hero in a large robo suit or just a person that gets really big like Ultraman. Right. Yeah. So think Pacific Rim. Yeah, exactly right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I just don't know. Or Power Rangers. Even though it's sci-fi, the whole concept that you would like stay in this city that's constantly being attacked by monsters who just bulldoze huge office buildings. Like, blows yeah. my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Honey, I can't move. This job pays too well. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of like just like living in a place where there's hurricanes. To an extent, <laughs> but the hurricane doesn't choose the city it attacks. I mean, if you buy a, a house that's like ne- in like Hurricane Alley... Yeah, not um, a thing. But uh, you, you know, Hurricane Alley on the coast. You kind of you you can't in, be too surprised when a hurricane knocks you, your house yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> I just love that comparison. Okay, fair enough. We, we, the other thing that this guy says is he's like, I'm not particularly like kaiju guy. I just really wanted to write a gross horror like exploding uh thing into kaiju. It was gnarly. <laughs> and explode it did. <laughs> So my favorite part of this comic book is when he transforms to, like, fight things and he comes back, it's so real. Like, he gets on a payphone to talk to his family and he's like, ah, and then the lady's like, I can see that you didn't find pants. Yeah, you're you're... on TV right now. Yeah, and your head is not returning to normal. Yeah, he's in big head mode. (laughs) And he's like, oh, dang it, my neck's going to hurt. That, to me, I was like, okay, this comic book is next level right now. (laughs) I laughed on the first page because there's this monologue from this cosmic entity that's awarding him these powers, and he's just like, okay, cool. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> his, his responses are just so like casual like kind of half awake so what's up uh-huh yeah okay so one of the interesting things is that he triggers people in this city to turn into kaiju right if like, they're infected yeah with the kaiju thing yep and he's around them it like makes it blossom inside of them so he gets big automatically and they get big automatically and they have it out. They mm-hmm. immediately turn into a monster. He immediately turns into, like, superhero being. Yep. His wife. First wife, we should say. His first wife and child she was pregnant with had this thing. And before it triggered the reaction, he, like, jumped out a window to get away from them. Mm-hmm. And then, like, never went to see them again. To essentially save them. Right. Which one would do, I guess. <laughs> Unfortunately, it fermented. Yeah, it made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> and now you have like this mega kaiju yes. that is just like one of the best character monster designs I've seen in a long time. She was like made of these like slugs things and like the relationship between the demented child that is just like in this embryo and the mother was just fascinating and like kind of like Silent Hill and it was just it it really it just really showed how invested he was in like telling us a very creepy, bloody story, mm-hmm. and I I I, I love that part of it. Right, and I think that what was super rad too is that they fight, and one of the three is just like dead, filleted on like a Empire State Building type looking building, and then it cuts to the next scene, and he's like, "It ate my foot," <laughs> and like you can see his guts are hanging out, mm-hmm. and it's like, "Oh shit!" The main character is going to be either maimed or die. Yeah. And and it's just like this realization of like, oh, that's the book I'm reading here. That's like, this is a fun book, but it's also a high stakes book. Yeah. Kind of a sad book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the monster and character design was amazing. I loved the egg ball that like shot out tubes that sucked people in like a vacuum. Yeah. And it got bigger as it sucked more people in mm-hmm. to the point it was just like bloated with dead people. Right. The idea of the city scabbing and all the blood that was left over was fucked Ugh. up. <laughs> so I, I think that the way that he talked about his book at the end where he was like, I'm inspired by stuff that was made before mass culture would consume it. Right. And so it was like made for highbrow, for the gatekeepers, for the highbrow people. 
And it was like, that's kind of what this comic book is, is this comic book is not pandering ever. It just is exactly his vision. And it is very rarely that you read a comic where it's like, this is exactly what this dude wanted to do that isn't just a zine. To the extent to which it is breaking normal comic book format, he points out that he's like, I can't do this in like 20 small chapters. He was like, this story needed to be told in a 60-page book. The next one will be told in a 40-page book. And we'll figure out from here on out whether you're buying, like, trades for part three or, like, a floppy comic for part four. Like, right. whatever we need. Which is interesting. Like, a, a lot of why you see artists that loved and flocked to a Netflix sort of model where if they had a 55-minute episode to tell their story and then 45 minutes the next, they could. Yeah. Like, why be bound by this format that forces you into creating extra fluff or extra storylines that you don't need. So I kind of respected that. That was, And it's an interesting, I guess, risk for a publisher to take with them too because you're saying, well, the point of entry for this is $8 now because you're writing such a massive mm-hmm. right. book, which is more expensive to print, more expensive to yeah. bind, harder for people to buy into. I think there was a precedent set though with like Headlopper. Also on image, sure. yeah, 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 which was like a quarterly, and then that that artist had not done a significant amount before that, and people loved it for the art and the story. I cannot believe Headlopper got print printed in like kind of a floppy normal <sighs> format. That's the most pages mm-hmm. I've seen like barely hung together by a staple. It was about to bust. That it staple was praying. Did not fit in my normal comic book bags. I had to buy like a larger bag just for my headlopper comics. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised they didn't bound headlopper issues to be to be honest. They would now, I think. Have they? I mean, cuz new issues have come out. They, I think they're still in the old method of Are they just really? like Yep. Okay. Praying these big old staples can hold this thing. I think with Ultra Mega, though, somebody was like, hey, we had this shit over here with Ed Lopper. I, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Yeah. And he was like, all right, charge two bucks more. Yeah, right. Yeah. Make if, it. If, if you take the risk on this book, you will get the reward. Yeah. Of a, just a phenomenal story. Let's move to Eros slash Psych. <laughs> worst, we said this last time last week on like Worst Name. This is the, mo- the worst name of a comic book <laughs> I have ever <laughs> seen in my entire life it is so forgettable and like nothing just you, blah. you know it's gonna be heady you know <laughs> yeah. it's gonna be academic do you know what eros and psyche is explain they're two greek gods yeah it's something like that oh i was just bullshit <laughs> oh it's it's something like cupid and something else it is something mm-hmm. like that oh well that makes sense once you find out what the story's about right yeah so uh, did you find out what the story was about? The book was pretty <laughs> abstract and minimal, I would say. Very abstract and like every page you turn, I kept on being like, "Wait a minute, did I miss something here?" Like more normally when that happens, I'm like, "Fuck this book." This book I was like, "Huh. Okay. Like, let's go, I guess." <laughs> I wasn't quite as into it as you, but I it was intriguing enough where it kept me going through. We we didn't mention that this is published by Ablaze, mm-hmm. which we've done a couple comics on them before, but not enough to I don't have a feeling of the publisher Ablaze really. Same. And I know that Maria Lovett who wrote and illustrated this book has done books on Boom that you may be familiar with or Image. Uh, Faithless 1 and 2. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, Luna, she's working on it, Boom. Yeah. And then Heartbeat or something was an Image book, I oh, think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, but in any case, I was surprised to see her do something on a blaze. The sparsity of this one, once I got it open, seemed to make a little more sense on a smaller publisher. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like a weirder, riskier book. He- here's what I think... I I totally agree with that. I think had this book been on Boom or Image, an editor would have been like, no, like, you can't do quite that. Like, you got to, like, tie it together a little bit. It can't be so ethereal and so sparse. But on a blaze, I don't know them, but it kind of assumed they're just like, oh, yeah, we're just happy to have the comic book. Just just keep on going. (laughs) (laughs) You have a book done? We'll take it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just uh, print (laughs) <laughs> the narrative is very much like a vibe of like, I remember back when I met this person and we're, we're both hurt souls now, but I wouldn't trade anything because some of my best moments were with them. 
it's like your typical sort of breakup story being told from the present about the past, mm -hmm. only with the fact that this is some sort of magical school for um, gifted or abstract, like witches, some sort of occult thing. Occult thing. We we never see anyone. But there's like, no instructors. There's no instructors that I can tell. There's a <laughs> so it's a liberal arts <laughs> witchcraft school. There's one. I mean, there's no definition surrounding this at all. So we don't know if there are instructors or not. It, it seems like this one student is the like epicenter of it, and a lot of people are like drawn to her. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's something bigger at play there. But like we mentioned, a lot of this is so amorphous that it's really hard to say how much you're supposed to read into those things. So this book's a vibe. I think that's exactly right. It's a witchy vibe if you like this artist and um, those more spacey, like I'm feeling this out. Mm -hmm. If I was 15 mm. reading this when I thought like I was really deep and heavy and I had like a thought journal that yeah. all my teenage emotions I thought were like the most epic things anyone had felt or thought, um, I probably would have loved this then. Yeah. I, I think that this is also a translation for like romance novels to a younger audience mm -hmm. where it's like, well, how do I want romance novels? Oh, I just, I don't want just like Fabio fucking the shit out of like a MILF. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, what books are you reading? I think that's, that's typically what a Harlequin ro romance book is. Like, it's just like, it's like, oh, check, 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 uh, you know. Fabio, buff. check, MILF, check. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. And then and then they're like, okay, well how do we how do we like stage this romance down? Oh, we're going to get artsy, weird kind of alt. Like Faithless is the sexiest book bar none I have ever read in my entire life. It does clap cheeks, I'll give it that. <laughs> Are you just saying that because of the covers though? Yes, yes, it, solely because of the covers. Content Sorry. Content within is not it's not like the horniest or sexiest book I've ever no, read. By no, no, sorry, no. I meant I meant cover covers a a yes. It's a <laughs> sexual book. Yeah, standalone covers. I mean, the first book was pretty. The first comic was pretty sexy, and then it, it kind of demony. Yeah, it didn't go quite like full on sex after that. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I guess you're right. There's sexier books ever, like or but bigger than that. But yeah, walk that statement back. <laughs> <laughs> Those covers, though, come on. No, no, no. I'm the curator of the Mount Rushmore of horny comics, and that book's not making it on my on my Mount Rushmore. Although I will say, there, that is the book where a literal butthole was you on saw, the front cover you saw of one. brown in the butthole, like, and it wasn't poop stain. It was, like, deep in the butthole. It was the most graphic butthole. Oh, my God. This is not It was crazy. <laughs> so, like, you, can, you can't tell me that doesn't make your fucking Rushmore. Doesn't make my rush more. Um, you just also... said it. You said you said it doesn't make the Mount Rushmore. Oh, I thought you were saying like rush more. <laughs> no, I need the mount in front of it. To oh, understand. sorry. Okay, you sorry. Always got a mount. Yeah. Or else, or else, I'm talking about the movie. Is that what it is? I guess. Okay. I don't know. It doesn't make your mount rush more. No, it doesn't. And I, I, I'm also one to th say that a butthole isn't necessarily like a horny, erotic a horny or sexy thing <laughs> depends yeah. on who you talk yeah, to yeah don't on one knock day. it till you try it jeez mm -hmm. <laughs> getting Maybe. back to this book <laughs> alright yeah let's zero move zero buttholes in this book no it was like for some of the covers you would expect it to have been a little more of a romance and mm -hmm. while it's that in spirit and narrative there's so far it's Mostly a friendship, would you say? Yeah. I, do we even the maybe the synopsis of the book gives us more of an idea that this actually turns into more of like a um, does, does, relationship? But I think it's just a friend bond. Yeah. Does eros mean love, and psyche means mind? So there's they're always at like that battle between like head and the heart. Okay. Solved it. You did it. Moving on <laughs> to our next book. <laughs> Maybe Greg cracked the code and now we got to move on. <laughs> All right, this is, uh, I think we're going to make the biggest meal of this conversation. Oh, maybe. fuck yeah, I brought my fork and knife. <laughs> this book fucking ripped. It's called Orphan and the Five Beasts. It was out on Dark Horse with words and art by James Stokoe. 
He's been doing the B covers of Warhammer 2099. <laughs> <laughs> Man, remember Warhammer? <laughs> it's back. So weird. It was. It, I stayed on it. I le- I bought all of his covers, and it was great. James Stoku is probably most known f- uh, for Orkstain. Yeah. Um, and then he also did a very famous thick graphic novel called Wonton Soup. That's probably oh, what he's most, yeah, most yeah, famous yeah. for. Um, and so if you have not read Wonton Soup, you need to read it. It's like Iron Chef meets like c- Cracked Out Adventure Time. <laughs> it's so cool and good. James Stoku's art very much sticks out because, um, one, because of his drawing styles, he'll leave like the pen markings on for when he like does his coloring so you'll like see the like heavy like line marks and stuff and then his color palette is always kind of radiates from a pink like you you uh-huh. always get these like pink bloody tones yeah he doesn't ink traditionally mm-hmm. um th- this book validates purchase on just art and aesthetic alone yeah for sure yeah and on top of that i think it was a great entertaining story too so we're already at a uh, winning status for me Mm-hmm. This is this is the book of the week. Pick of the week. Pick of the week. Man, we haven't done that in a long time. Pick of the week. I don't, I don't know if we always have a clear one, but this one's pretty pretty damn clear for me. Yeah. Um, this book stars Orphan Mo, <laughs> who is like a person taken in by your typical like samurai dojo master. Yeah. And he passes the torch of like their distinct fighting style and the power it withholds. So she can go take on and kick ass this. These uh, five beasts. Yeah, these five beasts who are uh, ruining some like nearby village. Right. Pretty typical kung fu, ancient, feudal Japan sort of story. Yep. But uh, I guess his twist and take on it and just how outrageous a lot of the scenes are um, <laughs> makes it really fun and interesting. There's the main big bad, for this issue anyway... Is a guy named Thunder Thighs, who's got like ripped ass veiny thighs the size of oak trees. Yep. So much so that he explodes the horse that he's riding upon. Squeezes it to death. Yeah. He only's like, I only got two laps in. Bring me another horse. <laughs> so what? One thing that uh, that James did very famously in Orkstain is the the currency in that book. I believe are goblin penises Uh and so like a lot of the characters carry around like sacks of like dicks and Uh balls and it's just like it's so graphic but also drawn so well that it just is very enticing and that's the same thing that happens here with these giant thighs that explode (laughs) the horses it's like so graphic but also like i kind of want to touch it like kind of makes sense like okay (laughs) Like there was some care and thought put into the like anatomy and design of yeah, the like, character. There was oh, research done I, for Thunder Thighs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's it if you've ever watched Dragon Ball Z and when they're like, you know, hulking out Super uh, Saiyan going Super Saiyan and you think they should be exploding now, that's what a James Doku book is like. <laughs> but they actually explode. <laughs> well, I think and that's purposeful because they say in the book that these beasts have to keep moving or else they'll die. Oh yeah. It's be- the perpetual motion, like a shark. Yes, exactly right. So there was some thought behind it, and the the book itself, it sounds like it's just like this funny romp with like kind of these uh, outlandish and cartoonish fight scenes, but there's actually a pretty kick-ass story behind it uh, that has uh, this thought about these five, uh, like, they're, they're spirits of the town that want to learn this kung fu style and then, like, say that they'll fight this big bad, this, like, wolf character, mm-hmm. in exchange... To where they'll help the town and learn the, uh, the 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 martial arts and help the city. Well, they said "fuck you" and then dipped out when they beat the wolf guy. And now have, they have to hunt down the five uh, spirits that uh, you know backed out on their deal. The five spirits in this book were very much like a sort of Jedi who bails on their training early mm-hmm. and then becomes tempted by the dark side because of that. Ben yeah. Solo. Yeah. They're all the five Ben Solos. <laughs> they each have their own virtue, which yes. again feels like a pretty typical Japanese folklore. Japanese thing. folklore sort of thing. One's like courage. Yeah. Being punctual. <laughs> always flushing the toilet. <laughs> it 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 does Tipping 15%. it does feel like a samurai journey story. Yeah. Uh, in like in a way that like if you've ever read one of those, this is going to be very familiar. Uh-huh. And then it like goes zany out like. Th- mostly through the artwork, I would say. I don't think it's like 
there's nothing in it that's necessarily laugh out loud funny. No. Other than just like visually, it's so cuckoo bananas mm-hmm. that it's yeah, I get a kick out of it for sure. Love it. Yeah. Think like uh, Tarantino. If like Tarantino directed a samurai film, like Kill Bill or whatever, like it's definitely <laughs> we don't have to say if did. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if he if he well I don't know, but it's 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 bloody and it's like kind of cheeky, and it's just it it's just big stylized. It's this big stew of awesome, and then it, it's such a delight. Right, beautiful. I I hate that it's a limited series, but I think it's hard for him to do all the art and all the writing. Oh, I can't imagine. It yeah. was so detailed. And like all the coloring. Yeah. I didn't notice this, but all the books that we covered today, the, writers, the writer and the artist are the same. We had a whole show with the same artist and writer on every book. That's crazy. Give, yeah, that's kind of cool. Creators in the truest sense. Yeah. <laughs> the true creator. 199. That's what episode we're on. Mm-hmm. We, we did a special one for you. Every single book is also the writer. And the illustrator. Uh, completely on purpose. We love <laughs> themes. We this st- way, episode 200 could be just static. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what we're going to do? Do we want to tease anything for that? I don't think we have anything special planned. I'm no. going to do the show naked. If, ooh, I'm going to wear, wear a clown mask. Okay. So that's two things happening that you can't enjoy when you're listening. Mm-hmm. They'll uh, know. <laughs> They'll know. I uh, We normally go all out for... Big episodes, if you've been listening for a long time, Mm -hmm. we've done things like review the Snyder Cut. Oh, reviewed our own first episode. We've (laughs) Halloween episodes are typically straight nuts. All improv. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. We've gone on camping expeditions where we meet spirits. We said the word how many hot dog over and over again. That was maybe (laughs) the the the, my least favorite improv episode. <laughs> that was our April 1st one. Yeah, that was not our biggest uh, crowning achievement. That was our first foray into like funny episodes. Yeah, it's like, oh, we're going to be funny. We're going to trick our viewers into never listening to us again. <laughs> and it worked for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we're going to be pretty normal okay. on 200. All right. We've yeah. earned it. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like when you are so good in the NFL and you you scored your fifth touchdown like you don't it's weird to do a dance yeah you just hand it off to the ref and go hey yeah okay we're winning got it fifth in one game yeah okay (laughs) you're winning (laughs) by a lot I'm very good at this I get it Uh, 200 we're like we've done it we've we've been around the block a little bit this is our fifth touchdown in one game (laughs) yep episode up uh, uh, next week so be prepared for that whatever that is yeah. now 250 we may get a wild hair mm-hmm. <laughs> and do something funky all right everybody we'll see you next time catch us on the patreon for things like maybe a game maybe a question <laughs> and maybe a book <laughs> maybe a book <laughs> fun it's all there all right we'll talk to you later bye bye The music on First Issue Club is courtesy of the fine folks at Primary Color Music. For more content, find us on social media as at First Issue Club, visit us at firstissueclub.com, or listen to bonus episodes when you support us at patreon.com slash firstissueclub.